All right, guys, big interview today. Kyle Nelson, you might know him from this stacked Canadian card where we absolutely swept. How's it going, Kyle? Uh, it's going great. You know, we're kind of in the middle of the, next, the training camp now for my next fight, September 16th. Yeah, and when you're getting prepared for camp, is it, a, is it a lot different, your lifestyle, versus when you're out of camp, or are you a guy that keeps things more consistent throughout? No, it's pretty consistent. Uh, you know, we just do a little, obviously, we ramp up kind of the cardio and the strength and conditioning and, and make the sports-specific sessions a little more intense. But for the most part, I have the same routine. We just, yeah, ramp everything up. And do you find that's better just like mentally wise, like you're able to consistently have that, um, well, I guess just consistency of it. Like I know some fighters really like try and take it a little too easy um, in between camps. Do you think the mental part of it being consistent and everything like that is a big, uh, is a big bonus? Yeah. And again, it's between camps where, you know, I'll add new skills and, and work on maybe areas that I need to improve. Once you're in the training camp, it's more or less about like getting you yourself into peak condition and then maybe critiquing a couple of little finer points for the specific opponent. But like when you're in training camp, you don't, you know, try and learn a flying arm bar. Or you don't add a bunch of new stuff to your, your tool bag. It's kind of just refining what you do have and then kind of critiquing it for your opponent while getting in the best shape you can. So it's the time between fights that I take to, you know, if I want to improve on a certain takedown or a certain submission defense, that's what I'll do in between training camps. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point too because you've seen guys in fights throw stuff that they said they never even tried in camp and it hasn't gone well or when things aren't really going well in the fight, they have to try and throw one of those desperation moves that you typically wouldn't train, like an Imanari roll or something like that. Um, when you're in camp, and you're getting prepared, what's harder, the week before fight week or actual fight week? Well, fight week is pretty easy. Fight week's the best because you're free, <laughs> you know, you're done pretty much all the hard work. You know, we'll still do some like some cardio and strength and conditioning stuff, but by that point, like you've you've basically made it. Now you're just kind of, you know, hanging around, resting, recovering, and, and waiting for the fight. So mm. I would say, yeah, probably the the two weeks leading up to to the fight week are probably the hardest. Mm -hmm. and you're water loading then and you're uh, having to wind your diet down and control your fats and everything like that um and then when fight week comes you're able to kind of relax a little bit what's it like mentally though the night before the fight like on a friday night you just have to sit there and go to bed like what goes through your mind because if it was me i know the only thing i'd be thinking about was what's going to happen tomorrow but that's hard to think about and then also shut your brain off at the same time too to go to sleep yeah yeah it's and when i was younger and, and first got in the ufc you know like that that night before would be kind of hard to get some sleep but you know after you do your weight cut and all that stuff and make weight and you refuel and stuff like your body's already kind of gone through a lot so it's mm -hmm. ready to to get some sleep and now that i'm so experienced you know it's, it's pretty easy for me to you know kind of turn that part of my brain off i've already you know worked for six or eight weeks up to that point to get ready for you know the fight so there's nothing i'm going to be able to do that you know, Friday night before the fight that's going to, you know, affect the fight. I've already got the game plan. I'm already in shape. I've already put all the hard work in. So I might as well kind of relax and enjoy the moment. And you're going to be going from one of the most stacked Canadian cards to one of the most stacked fight nights we've seen in a really long time. It's a great card. You're fighting Fernando Paldilia. How do you feel about that matchup? I think it's a great matchup. He, you know, kind of burst on the UFC scene. Uh, you know, he fought Julian Arosa, a guy mm. that I've trained with a lot in Las Vegas. Um, and yeah, he did well, you know, he was landing some nice shots, you know, kind of boxing at range and, uh, kind of caught Julian earlier on. I think it, it might've been a little bit of an early stop, especially yeah, knowing Julian, he, you know, Julian likes to get in those wars and he'll take some shots and he'll come back and he'll kind of, you know, he'll work through it. So it might've been a bit of an earlier stoppage, but you know, that just adds to the hype of, uh, Fernando. So I think, you know, we're going to match up well, he's, he's a, you know, a good boxer, got some good jujitsu and stuff. But I think all around, I'm definitely better. Yeah, that was an interesting fight because I was there at the apex and my eye line was right with Julian's and it was the strangest knockout or not. I, you can't even call it that because he went in and out in just a matter of a second from the time he got hit was going down then his eyes opened back up. I've never seen that before, but I definitely thought it was early. But that sticks with me as one of the strangest moments in UFC history that I've seen just the way that progression kind of went down. And I talked to Nick Sick about it and he even said like, yeah, that was that was weird because he out up and then right back at it uh, but again julian a fighter that um, i have tremendous respect for he's got a great style and obviously training with him before sets up well for this fight especially because of this potential striking battle you're going to go through here but um talking about striking we just saw o'malley finish aljo in a uh 
spectacular fashion, I guess you could describe it as. What did you think about that finish? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was here in Hamilton watching the fights at Shoeless Joe's and like everybody was asking me who I thought was going to win. And, you know, I was pretty adamant that, you know, Aldermaine Sterling was going to get the takedown either in the first or the second and probably, you know, catch a submission. Mm-hmm. And then everybody in the bar was like, no, no, Sugar's going to win. I'm like, okay, whatever, guys. And then I had to sit there while everybody was, you know, jumping around going crazy after O'Malley knocked him out. So it was uh, it was definitely a shock. Um, but yeah, I mean, his, his long, lanky style, that's, that's what I said before. I was like, if he's going to win, he's going to have to catch him with like that, that long cross. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of my only thought for, for a finish. Uh, I didn't think he'd win the decision. You know, obviously he wasn't going to win any of like the grappling or the ground kind of battle. So it was going to be that, that long right cross. And yeah, he touched him with it and uh, yeah, he was able to finish him. Yeah. I was on the submission train too. I, I said that a few times. I even thought like the second round was going to be Algermain's and I, I was completely wrong. And that's one thing when it comes to MMA is when you, you just kind of slightly think about it. I feel like you have a better job at picking it. Then when you really have to make that pick, it always seems like it goes on the, the flip side of it. That's just kind of the way things go. Um, people that bet on the UFC card that was in Vancouver, though, they did very well if they did an all Canadian parlay. Was that you think the greatest moment in Canadian MMA history was that entire card? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it's, it's hard to get any better than that. I mean, having, you know, George St. Pierre and stuff being the champion is always great. Double champion now. Um, but yeah, for like the whole, you know, six kind of UFC guy, people from from Canada to to sweep like that. It's it's hard to think of, a, you know, a better overall night, you know, for Canadians in the UFC. And to speak more on Ontario, Ontario doesn't really have a lot of regional MMA, partly because of the cost that the commission has, because it's so expensive to have fights here. It's just not very feasible, especially for some of the fighters not getting paid much. They might lose money just to show up and fight. Do you think those rules and regulations are holding back MMA in Ontario? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the commission, I mean, it, like it wasn't even legal in Ontario till what, like 2010 or 10 mm-hmm. or 11. So it's definitely, you know, the commission has definitely been slow, you know, kind of pushing and, and you know, holding back um, MMA in Ontario and even amateur MMA is still like a gray area and stuff. So once we can get some amateur MMA going, I think that'll help build the scene. And then, yeah, if we could find a way, I know there's a lot of stuff going on with the athletic commission now with some new people kind of getting on board mm-hmm. uh, that will hopefully help kind of, you know, sort that out, maybe make the the medicals a little bit more feasible and make some of the, the commission, you know, fees a little bit cheaper so that we can have more shows. Cause I know mm-hmm. there's like, I think Ontario and Toronto will have some of the, you know, the best UFC fans and MMA fans. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, it's very financially difficult to put shows on. Yeah. And that's one thing that surprised me. I was talking to one of the guys from KHI Press about this when we were at BTC 21 in Kitchener. And I go like, oh, why isn't there more? And he explained this to me. And I thought it was a little bit of, it, I mean, it's really inside MMA. It's not something a lot of people are going to talk about. But as a, you know, someone that tries to support the sport, uh, that kind of bothered me a little bit because overregulation, I don't think is going to support the sport at all. And if guys are going to leave Ontario to go fight in some of the other US states that potentially have Ray to lax regulations or they have to go overseas uh, that could be a that's i think a bit of a detriment um to the sport and it could result in guys getting hurt that didn't need to if they were just able to fight at home also guys would make more money if they could fight at home uh, but it's a very interesting subject but i also heard something about you and starting a beer what is this yeah so i'm working with new ontario brewing uh it's up in north bay uh i you know i worked with uh, the head brewmaster brian a little bit in the past and yeah, now we finally come together and collaborated to make a beer. So you'll see kind of my picture on the on the beer, and it's called Fight Camp Light Lager. It's available in Huntsville, like my hometown, at Mustelanis, uh, Burks Falls, a little farther north at River Bowl, and then obviously in North Bay at New Ontario Brewing, and then down here in Hamilton, we're going to have it at Shoeless Joe's Hamilton. So it's kind of spreading all over. It's going to be uh, you know available in a lot of places here in Ontario. And if you're not uh, anywhere near one of those places, you can always head over to newontariobrewing.com and you can order it online and they're able to ship it to almost anywhere in Ontario. That's going to be pretty cool for you coming from, you know, fighting in the regional scene, fighting all over the place to be able to be in the UFC and then have this beer situation. Do you uh, have to pinch yourself sometimes? Like, what is the feeling like to accomplish the goal that many people try and get? Yeah, I mean, especially these last couple of years, uh, you know, I, you know, the starting even with the fight in, in England against Jai Herbert, it didn't necessarily go my way. You know, the judges are what the judges are. Uh, but I feel like that's kind of when I started like a, you know, I kind of turned a new leaf, you know, I'm performing better. Um, and I think everything else is coming to, to together 
better in my life as well. So, you know, it was stuff like this beer going on, stuff like my gym, Muskoka Martial Arts up in Gravenhurst. I mean, it seems like everything's kind of finally coming together for me. And now we're seeing that with my performances with, uh, you know, again, another unfortunate draw with uh, with the Korean Superboy. Uh, but then my last fight, you know, we got the win and now another, you know, good opponent with a lot of hype and stuff. And, you know, looking forward to another victory this time. One final question. The main event, a very interesting one, Grosso versus Shevchenko too. Who do you think wins that? I'm leaning towards Shevchenko. I think she's going to do basically everything the same, just not throw the spinning back kick. You know, I think that was kind of her, her downfall in the last fight. And it was something that Grosso, you know, had already, I mean, obviously trained for because we saw kind of videos of like backstage of her, like, you know, practicing that sidestep and taking the back. So I think if she doesn't do that and can keep it standing, we'll probably see her, you know, each eke out a uh, decision. I think, mm-hmm. I don't think Grasso is going to be able to like shoot a double leg and take her down. I think the only hope is to kind of catch a kick or, or do some kind of tricky like that. But I think uh, Shevchenko is going to be a lot more calculated, you know, take less risks, just stick to the basics. And I think she'll be able to eke out a decision. And I said last question, but I got one more because you just got something in my brain that I was thinking about. Brad Tavares versus Chris Weidman. Brad's known for having very strong kicks. He's a bit of a technician with it, one of the best guys in the sport at doing that. Chris Weidman really toughed it out in that fight. I guess he tore something during the rounds too. He was able to go through that. Um, could you put what Chris was probably feeling with absorbing all of those kicks into context for a casual MMA fan? Like what you could liken it to? Yeah, I mean, the the calf kicks there there's kind of there's a couple different feelings sometimes you'll get hit in that nerve and then it's basically from your knee down it's like your knee being asleep like you you don't feel it at all um sometimes you'll get uh like michael chandler when he was in bellator uh you know he just kept rolling his ankle because he, he didn't have any feeling so he couldn't tell what was going on with his ankle so sometimes you'll get that or sometimes it'll just shoot it's almost like a like a really bad nerve pain kind of going up your calf and then again it swells up and stuff and makes it very difficult to walk around and move and stuff. And you saw that with, um, you know, with Chris Weidman and later on with Neil Magny, you know, having a very hard time moving around. And obviously when you can't move, it's hard to throw punches because you can't close the distance. You can't transfer the weight to build power. You can't shoot double legs because you can't push off hard enough to, to, you know, to penetrate on the double legs. So it's definitely a, a very useful technique that a lot of people are catching on nowadays. Now, the answer to the calf kick is pretty simple as well. It's just a regular Muay Thai check. You just don't pick your leg up as much. Now, I believe Chris Weidman and even Neil Magny, they were kind of picking their leg up almost like a check, but they weren't turning their knee and their toes towards the incoming kick. So when on the calf kick, if you pick your leg up, you still get kicked in the calf. And sometimes it hurts even worse because it's just kind of floating in the air there. So you got to turn your knee out into the the shin or the foot. And then once you do that once or twice, usually guys will kind of slow down on those calf kicks because they'll end up hurting their foot or breaking their foot or something like that. That was absolutely amazing insight, man. Best of luck with your next fight. And I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And yeah, make sure everyone you check out the beer. I've got the links and stuff on my Instagram. So yeah, thanks a lot.